Look around you. What do you see? What is there to see? Well, I've said before, around me is a uh, mirror, a bookshelf, a statue of a Buddha, a lamp, a, uh, <laughs> a cabinet, and a painting, and a lamp, etc. Do those things actually exist? No. What does science tell me is around me? Matter, energy, and empty space. And matter, energy, and empty space can go for some further reduction. They don't phenomenally exist in and of themselves, except for as functions of each other. Um, even these things don't necessarily exist, phenomenally speaking. They don't even exist, even if we accept them at face value. That mirror only exists, or it only makes any sense to me, because I'm a human being, I rely upon my eyes, and I have the idea that I want to look at myself or see things in that mirror. My eyes are sensitive to photons. One little thing out there, they're sensitive to. They show me an image, an extremely biased image, because there's a lot more out there to see uh, than photons in terms of the things that I could be sensitive to. Um, but that's what my eyes are sensitive to. So my brain gets a biased image of what is actually out there. Um, that mirror makes sense because I'm a visual creature. But if you get an alien from another dimension or another planet or something that's non-anthropomorphic, whose mind works completely differently than ours, wouldn't have a clue what that mirror is. There would be no purpose for that mirror. There would be no place in its mind for mirrorness. That mirror would just be a nonsensical thing that doesn't make any sense at all. Its senses might not even pick up on things like photons or whatever. It might be sensitive to other things, radiation or whatever. Um, so it and I might be looking at the very same thing when they look at that mirror over there. And the image that gets put into our brains, if it has a brain or whatever its center of intelligence is, forms a picture of the same thing that is completely and utterly different. And in fact, it could be like, as I mentioned previously, an eye in the doorway. I might, if I was able to see what it saw uh, when we looked in, in that mirror or at that mirror, I might be horrified by what it saw. But that's neither here nor there. The point is, our senses are biased. Our senses only tell us certain things about what's going on out there. Uh, it doesn't tell us everything. Our senses don't tell us everything. Our senses don't co uh, corroborate or, or um, correlate things uh, in the same way. Sight um, and hearing, at least in terms of what's going on around us, tend to sort of crowd the other senses out at certain times. That too is a bias. It doesn't really, just because something's loud doesn't mean that it's um, more information or more actually happening around us. It's just that our senses will suddenly snap too when something loud happens. Um, more bias. None of this stuff actually exists. We've got to be conscious of what's going on around us. Um, my favorite Picasso quote is, if you want to paint, don't paint what you see. Paint what you know to be there. It's an ambition of mine to learn how to paint in the cubistic way. I'm not a bad amateur artist as these things go. I can uh, paint quite uh, well. I'm satisfied with my uh, level of painting. I'm satisfied with my level of sketching, but I'm not satisfied with my level of cubism. And I want to be satisfied with it. I would love to be able to paint uh, a cafe scene, for example, um, in a way that satisfies me that I've actually captured it properly in the, the the multi-dimensional world of cubism. I don't care if anyone else can make sense out of it, out of it or anyone else says that it's any good. Um, I want it to satisfy me. That's an ambition that I've got. I've all, often loved these cafe paintings that so many painters have um, uh, that do uh, sort of make a kaleidoscope of the human condition, just the scene in the cafe. And the cubist ones are the ones that fascinate me the most because they don't 
they, they tend to not differentiate things. Cubism tends to jumble everything together and thrust it right into your face. And to me, that's actually seeing things for what's actually there. Images that your mind processes are being processed. They're being categorized. They're being correlated. They're being uh, placed in the proper perspective with each other by your brain. It doesn't mean that they're phenomenally doing this. All the images that come at you are coming at you at once, simultaneously, um, and in no particular order whatsoever. Your brain is what imposes order onto it all. Your brain is what turns a completely random and crazy jumble of impulses, images, sounds, everything um, that are all being thrust in your face at once and your brain organizes everything. It doesn't mean that the things are actually organized out there. They're not. But your brain is the is the sort of bias that creates this. Now this is why um, I tend to think that um, the antinatalist view of the world is heavily biased and so heavily biased as to be more or less useless because you're, you, what you see when you look around you isn't what is actually there, it's what your brain imposes on what's around you. It's what you expect to see, it's what you want to see, or is what you, it's what you're afraid might be there. It's all down to desire again. Desire, as the so many ancient uh, Eastern scriptures say, is what creates the universe. Um, a lot of people understand that as thinking that your brain is actually creating everything, but it's not so much doing that as it is creating the concepts, the different categories of reality that make up what we think is reality. Our brain creates things like mirrors and bookshelves and cabinets and uh, potatoes and aspirins and uh, carving knives and uh, shoelaces. These things don't phenomenally exist. If we showed any of these things again, as I say, to an uh, extra dimension dimensional creature, they wouldn't understand what they were. They, they're, whatever reality they get is put on us by uh, put on it by us. Um, desire is real, but we've got to understand what it is, what desire is actually doing. Desire is taking a jumbled mass of everythingness, the entire universe, and creating an order out of it, which it, which the brain is imposing upon that chaos. The brain does that to absolutely everything. The brain does that in terms of value judgments on reality itself. Is reality good? Is reality bad? Reality is neither. Reality is whatever this says it is, um, which is why I have conclusively come to the uh, come to the conclusion. There's a tautology for you. Um, the depression is an illness beyond any shadow of a doubt. It's an illness because depression has nothing desirable about it. Um, but depression is real, and depression can be overcome. Ask anyone who's gone through a depression if they ever want to go back to that. It's like I often say that it's like having your head held under water for several months at a time. Uh, every second of your existence is a struggle for breath. And there's just it has no redeeming characteristics. Therefore, the most logical thing to do is to get out of that state. Because again, the world is neither bleak, nor hopeless, nor horrid, nor is it good, giddy, or happy. It's all in here. <laughs> Um, the world just is. Any value is something that we place on it. Um, David Benatar seems to think that um, coming into existence is a harm. That too is a value judgment. Harm is a concept that doesn't exist phenomenally. Uh, what is harm to one person might be ambrosia to another, as I've said. The difference is not phenomenally true the difference is in here. This is where the work needs to be done. It's not a question of just uh, eliminating sentience. That's not going to do it. The thing is to abolish harm in here. Uh, that's how you deal with antinatalism and uh, its sort of oh, orphan twin um, depression. If the world is a bleak place, it's not because it's phenomenally bleak. 
It's because the mind expects to see bleakness when it looks out onto reality. The mind wants to see bleakness, horror, futility, and agony when it looks out onto the phenomenal world. It expects to see these things, or it fears that this is probably the case. Work on this, and everything else changes. Um, I suppose, again, we can rely upon desire even to do that. If we feel bad, the desire to feel better is a desire in and of itself. You're riding the tiger of desire, as it were, to get from the bad state to the good state, to the preferable state. And no, I'm not talking about fooling yourself or blinding yourself to what's going on out there. What I'm saying is, what's going on out there might not be what is, or what you see might not be what is actually going on. Back to Picasso. Don't look at what's around you. Look at what you know to be there. It's a difficult thing to wrap one's head around, but... Um, I think that uh, that in this case, um, the good Mr. Benatar might be well advised to try that sort of thing. He's placing value judgments on existence, on harm, on all this sort of thing, which at the end of the day are nothing but value judgments, nothing but projection, nothing but bias. Our senses are biased, our minds are biased. The only information that we can get about the world around us are from our senses, which are only sensitive to certain specific things, and our minds fall into the furrows that are, um, that are hewn by our, uh, by our senses, if you allow your senses to take control of you. There's a lot more going on in the universe than is perceptible by our senses. We understand this. Science tells us that that's the case. Yet we still implicitly trust everything that our senses are telling us. Why do you suppose that is? Hmm. 